Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, afternoon session uh, on, uh, uh, like, within the strand of advocacy. Uh, my name is Maja Drabczyk. I'm Polish. I represent Centrum Cyfrowe, so uh, I think and do thank uh, based in Warsaw, but a very warm welcome to Katowice. I hope you're enjoying uh, the, the city, uh, the, the region. It's unique, Silesia. Um, today, uh, we want to... Um, introduce you to an initiative that we have been like, and by me, by we, I mean a global community of, uh, of passionate advocates towards uh, open culture heritage and open culture. We have been involved for the past at least two years, led by uh, Brigitte and Connor from Creative Commons. And uh, what we are trying to do uh, within this global uh, let's say, activity, is to create an instrument, a policy instrument, that will help us improve the openness of the uh, cultural heritage. And we want to do it in the context of UNESCO. Um, we will, so today, the, the session is divided into three parts. The first one is for us, and actually Brigitte and Connor to introduce you to the initiative and tell you a bit more about what it is that we are after, what our goals are and what the process is, and what the next steps uh, for us are. Then we have invited a group of uh, our uh, colleagues and experts to uh, introduce the team a bit more and the value of openness uh, uh, within or of uh, cultural heritage for different stakeholders and for different disciplines. And then finally, I hope it is over to you when uh, we ask for your support, support and your, um, your um, examples of, that can support uh, and provide evidence for our work. But we will like step by step hopefully introduce you uh, to, to all the three uh, tasks. Uh, without further ado, Brigitte, could you introduce what Tarek is? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Maya. So uh, my name is Brigitte Vizna, and I'm the Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. This is my first Wikimania event. I'm super excited to be here, and it's so nice to be in a room full of people. Uh, and I'm very excited about this initiative, and I hope that I can communicate that and I can spread my enthusiasm and my passion for this project in, the, in this session. Uh, so as Maya said, um, we have launched this initiative very recently, and I want to give you a little bit of context to bring you up to speed so that we can have that conversation uh, that we plan on having later on in this session. Um. <coughs> So maybe just a few words about Creative Commons first. Um, I think it doesn't need an introduction in this setting, um, but um, just to make sure that everyone is aware, we are a global nonprofit organization that was founded in 2001. We're the organization behind the open copyright licenses, the CC licenses, and public domain tools. And 20 years after our founding, we started the Open Culture Program uh, with generous funding from Arcadia. So thank you very much for supporting this um, really crucial work. Um, our main goal is really to promote the sharing and to help people reconnect with cultural heritage in the digital space. So we know that cultural heritage often sits in cultural heritage institutions, is used by a wide range of users, um, academics, scholars, uh, artists, uh, but also members of the general public. And we want to make sure that sharing is seamless and respectful in this complicated ecosystem. Uh, why Creative Commons? We think that our tools, uh, especially Creative Commons um, public domain dedication tool, CC0, and the public domain mark, are very important and useful tools to identify materials that are in the public domain and communicate that in a way that enables their reuse. So Creative Commons really supports the use of these tools in order to identify and tell everyone that these materials are in the public domain and can be reused by anyone for any purpose. 
Unfortunately, uh, in this day and age, there are still too few uh, open glams, so galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Too few cultural heritage institutions have an open access policy that enables anyone to use the objects in their collections in a free and um, open manner. Um, some estimates put them at around 1%. So only 1% of cultural heritage institutions worldwide uh, enable access to their users in, uh, in an unfettered way. This is far too little. And one of the reasons for that being the case is that we have a very lousy policy environment. <laughs> uh, the, the laws that govern how cultural heritage is being shared are not adapted to the online environment, and we end up with very um, insurmountable obstacles for cultural her heritage institutions to e enable access to their collections. And one of the culprits is copyright. A lot of the laws um, under copyright copyright make it very difficult for cultural heritage institutions to a digitize works in their collections and also make them available in a very open way so that they can stimulate further creativity and further uses. And so this needs to change. And this is why we're here. This is the main reason behind Tarek, is that the policy environment is not conducive to cultural heritage institutions making their collections available. And we think that this is one important pathway that we can change things. So Tarek stands for Towards a Recommendation on Open Cultural Heritage. The H was just added recently, and I'll explain a little bit why. It used to be Tarek without an H, but we realized recently that open culture was a little bit too broad as a concept, and many people understood different things under open culture, and so we really want to focus it on cultural heritage. What that is, uh, you know, we are not in, in the space to you come up with new definitions, so we're going to rely on what UNESCO uh, considers cultural heritage. But basically, the acronym is uh, a very handy way to simplify or to, um, to give it an idea of what the, the goal is, is that we're really trying to work towards a UNESCO instrument that would promote open solutions to enhance access to cultural heritage. So as Maya said, this is a community initiative. Uh, many of us here in the room are part of this community and the driving force behind this movement. Creative Commons of offers some kind of secretariat support for the moment you know, to make sure that the project uh, is running smoothly. But we really focus on community efforts. Our goal, like I said, is to really encourage UNESCO member states to draft and adopt a recommendation or another instrument promoting open solutions to enhance access to cultural heritage. So note that we are not adopting the recommendation. It's not a community recommendation. The ultimate goal is for UNESCO member states. And so we're not really in the driving seat when it comes to adopting the instrument, but as members of civil society, we can put pressure on member states and convince them that adopting such an instrument is a great idea. And what we think this instrument will change, so our ultimate outcome is that finally cultural heritage will be more equitably accessible to all. Uh, and in line with UNESCO's broader mission and open and heritage related policy goals. Because what many people maybe don't know is that UNESCO already does a ton of work in the field of open, open open educational resources, open science, open solutions. They actually call them open solutions in all sorts of fields. But somehow the connection between open and cultural heritage hasn't been made very clearly. And that's what we're in the business of, is to show that open access to cultural heritage is actually a way for UNESCO and its member states to achieve their goals. So we're not trying to force a square peg in a round hole. We're not trying to convince UNESCO to do something they've never done. We are actually in the business of showing them that open access is actually a very useful mechanism for them to achieve their cultural policy ambitions. They just haven't made that connection yet. And I'm generalizing, of course. <laughs> Um, to give you an, a few uh, key milestones of uh, how Tarek took off and where we stand now, uh, it was launched uh, last year, so it's uh, just a year old almost, uh, or just 
over a year old, I should say. And uh, in May in 2023, we organized a roundtable in Lisbon, which brought together uh, a lot of open culture enthusiasts and experts to kind of explore and get a lay of the land and see if there was potential for such a movement. And the conclusion was that there is. There was a lot of fresh enthusiasm, new connections, a lot of, of interest in pursuing this goal. Uh, <clears throat> we were then able to produce a, an information brief that kind of summarized what Tarek is about, um, what are its goals, what we think it can achieve. And uh, very happy to say that it's available in over 10 languages through uh, efforts by volunteers to translate it into their languages. Um, at the CC Summit in Mexico uh, in October last year, we held a session to identify what are the values and principles that underpin our movement towards open culture. So really trying to suss out what, are, what is our common foundation and if the value seems to be a good place to find common agreement and see what we're really in uh, for. <clears throat> and I'll come back to the values a little bit later, but the summit was also an opportunity to get more translations of our key documents. And I'm very proud to say that Connor is leading our translation efforts brilliantly. And we have, I think, a really wide variety of uh, resources in various languages. Uh, then at Glam Wiki in Montevideo, uh, some of you uh, were there. Uh, we held a, a session also to understand what would it mean to have Tarek for the Wikimedia community? And we came out of it with many lessons. And I would say some of them had to do with some of the risks and the pitfalls and kind of the boundaries that we need to respect if we're going to promote openness, what we need to be worried about, uh, what we need to be mindful about. Uh, one that comes to mind is um, access to cultural heritage in times of conflict or in zones of conflict. Uh, what is the impact of making cultural heritage available when there's a war or when um, you know, there's also humanitarian crises going on? So this is something that is fueling our reflections on how to approach openness in a, in a mindful way. Then this year, we held a community consultations on the values again. So it's been a very thorough process. We did lots of consultations, surveys, and I'm happy to say that we're coming up with a second draft of these values, which I think will really provide some common language and some common uh, vocabulary and, like I said, a foundation that really unites us and that we know that we're in it for the same things. Um, Maybe these will be around community and collaboration. There seems to be a lot of, uh, of support for this kind of values, for respect and trust, making sure that open does not break uh, uh, any trust relationships between peoples and their cultural heritage, and equity and sustainability. So again, ensuring that it's not open for open sake, but we are pursuing equitable uh, access. Um, and then the last milestone uh, that happened uh, very recently in May was that we held a strategic workshop in Lisbon again to really try to see, okay, now we have some principles, we have consensus on what we're in for, how are we going to do it? And that brought around 50 participants from all over the world who really got together to understand how the UNESCO process works and how can we build a roadmap with very clear steps on how we're going to convince UNESCO member states to adopt such a document. And I'll go into a bit more detail around this. And the latest milestones is, of course, right now at Wikimania. We're really hoping that this session will give us more data points to have um, a more informed process moving forward. Um, so this is a picture of our group. Like I said, we were around 50 people. We had a two-day workshop. The first day was really about bringing everybody up to speed, getting basic concepts uh, down and agreed upon. And the second day was about drafting this roadmap. So having a very clear path forward with steps about what everyone can bring to the table to move this initiative forward. Um, yeah, so our goal for the workshop was really to define that roadmap. But we also have very interesting outcomes. Uh, ten of them are summarized in the next few slides. First, we have some outcomes on the, of a substantive nature. Um, the first one I want to mention is that we have a rationale that is more clearly steeped in fundamental rights. 
So open access can, of course, um, help achieve many kinds of objectives, but we realize that uh, open access to cultural heritage has a real grounding in uh, enabling people to enjoy their fundamental rights of access to cultural heritage and enjoyment of the arts that is in Article 27 of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in Article 15 of the uh, UN International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So it is a way to, for people to realize and enjoy that fundamental right. We also have a clear position within the UNESCO normative landscape. So UNESCO is a huge uh, UN organization which, uh, with a massive mandate spanning culture, science, and education. It's very complex. Even cultural heritage matters are divided within sectors at UNESCO. So we're not solely dealing with the cultural sector. There is some issues that are being dealt with under communication and information. Um, so it's, it's a very complex and crowded, I want to say, normative landscape. And so burdening, so to speak, UNESCO with yet another, another instrument is not the right way to go. We need to find ways that build upon all the instruments that already exist and really insert ourselves in a strategic way to show that openness is a way to achieve those other objectives in the normative landscape and not contradict them. Um, we also have a, a refined substantive scope on open heritage. That's what I mentioned earlier on with the extra H. It used to be Tarak, open culture. Now it's Tarak, or however you want to pronounce it, uh, with CH, really with a focus on cultural heritage. And there we try to kind of sidestep all the issues that have to do with contemporary creativity and the rights of artists and contemporary creators who still enjoy copyright in their works. So we want to make sure that we um, are really focused on cultural heritage uh, and even a narrow focus on uh, preserving the public domain. And we think that this is a strategic um, move for us to come in very narrow uh, with a very specific ask and make that issue so important uh, that there, there's going to be no choice <laughs> but to adopt an instrument. So not trying to cover all assets of culture that proved to be, you know, that big tent that we wanted to build just collapsed. So we're just going to go under public uh, cultural heritage in the public domain. That might change, but that's where we are now. We also uh, had some formal and process-related outcomes. Uh, we have a clear understanding of uh, the elaboration and the negotiation process at UNESCO, thanks to UNESCO experts and representatives at that workshop. Um, we know the timeline, we know what kinds of documents need to be submitted at what time, etc. And that seems very formal and maybe a little bit tedious, but it's crucial if we want to be um, making interventions at the right time and with the right uh, stakeholders. We also have a more agnostic position on the nature of the instrument. So TAREC, as you remember, stands for Towards a Recommendation on Open Culture. And a recommendation refers to something very specific at UNESCO. It's a very specific kind of instrument. And in order of uh, importance or the level of uh, binding force, we have conventions, which are the most binding, then recommendations, and then underneath declarations, and then underneath all kinds of other instruments. And we've been told that a recommendation is quite hard to get, even though there's one on OER and there's one on open science. We thought, well, then the next instrument on open culture should be a recommendation. Uh, but some experts have said, you know, you might want to try a declaration first. It's got a lower bar and it's maybe a little bit easier to get past member states. So we're agnostic and we'll see how far we can get. Of course, a recommendation is still our goal, uh, but as a kind of plan B, uh, we'd settle for a declaration. Uh, we also have a clearer sense of alignment with ongoing UNESCO and U UN work. As I said, uh, a lot of work is ha actually happening on open access within UNESCO, especially for education, arts education, digital commons, uh, PAC for the Future of the UN. There's so many initiatives that are aligned, and we want to make sure that we are in that flow and that we're not uh, you know, acting in isolation, but show these connections and show that we're actually all contributing to these efforts uh, to make access to culture more, uh, more equitable uh, and in line with, uh, with future trends. Uh, 
And then finally, in terms of outcomes, uh, I think we could feel a lot of energy and optimism and hope in the room after the workshop. We really have a galvanized open community that is super eager to, to continue this work. And I hope again that uh, some of you in this room will also um, will join us. Um, there's an imperative need to also act together that Creative Commons has been leading this so far, but there's clearly a need to organize and partner with order, other organizations. And uh, we're really open to having conversations. We're in the process of kind of organizing the work, but this is something that we want to do with others. And we are already have some informal support, uh, but we hope to materialize this and formalize this really soon. And we have a nascent architecture to organize future action. So next week or in a few days, um, we're going to get together and really try to build what would be the different paths for volunteers to come in and join. Uh, we don't want to make an open invitation, you know, get involved. We want to have very clear pathways and ladders of engagement so that people have a clear sense of what they're contributing to and that this really comes together and has more impact. Uh, so this is a picture of the draft world map that we <laughs> managed to get together in Lisbon. As you can see, we have a lot of ideas for like right now. <laughs> it's very crowded. And then later on, we're like, oh, well, what will happen next? Um, and I'm sure that it's going to be as busy. But this is where we are right now. And we're translating this into a concrete action plan. The main takeaway, I have to say, is that even though we have a very good argument, and we are very good at like abstract arguments, we need clear evidence to support our case. Um, we really need to convince UNESCO member states with success stories, with case studies, with things that they can, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, relate to, hmm. anyways, that they can really engage with because they understand and they feel like, oh yes, this is, this is a real problem and it's our responsibility to, to solve it. If we want us to have a thriving uh, commons of cultural heritage, we need to have open access and um, this is what we're into. So uh, this brings me to the last slide before we move on to a panel discussion. But what I wanted to say is that we're here to um, help ourselves and each other to gather evidence to demonstrate how open access to cultural heritage is actually a way to help people exercise their fundamental rights to participate in cultural life and enjoy the arts, the articles I already mentioned, and also to benefit from a more po prosperous, inclusive, and re resilient word by advancing the sustainable development goals. So open access is also a way to support achievement of those goals and make culture also a goal in and of itself. And to enjoy culture and the digital commons as global public goods, as has already been recognized by UNESCO in the Mondial Declaration adopted in Mexico City in 2022. So we're really building on the existing framework and showing how openness is a solution in order to uh, help UNESCO and its member states achieve their goals. Uh, so now I'll hand over to my colleague, Connor Benedict, who's going to moderate a panel uh, with our esteemed colleagues. So thank you so much. And I'm actually going to get a microphone. Thank you, Brigitte. Thank you, Maya, for this lovely introduction. Um, my name is Connor Benedict. I work at Creative Commons on the Open Culture Program together with Brigitte and a number of other folks in the room. Um, so my first question is for Ivan. Ivan joins us from Mexico City, where um, he works on um, digital rights and the protection of digital rights at R3D. And my question for you today is, how can open heritage help strengthen education what are we thinking about in terms of the creation of OER and um, especially a push for critical thinking around this? Yes, I think, um, thanks for the invitation for the panel first and thanks everyone for being here. I think uh, the work together with the Open and Creative Commons community and the Tarok initiative, it's crucial having Wikimedians there. So it's, it's an open invitation, of course. 
Uh, well, in context like Mexican, uh, the openness is not only heritage. Of openness in general is crucial for educators and cultural actors. We have a strong cases and a strong demonstration on how the use and the promotion and the creation of OERs is uh, a change definitively in the way that the educators and the cultural workers work more relax uh, without the doubt or without being anxious or being uh, being suspicious of of of, of uh, violating copyright because in Mexico we have the worst copyright world in the world the last law in the world is uh, 100 years after the death of the author it's terrible and it's uh, it's a de it's dimensional <laughs> but yeah, and we are trying to, to to we are working to in that with the legislators to to move that that uh, number but actually that's the reality so uh, we have testimonials, we have um, like uh, cases and evidences, sorry, I say it in Spanish, um, of educators or universities that being sued by copyright uh, barons to, of, of use uh, copyrighted materials with the uh, good faith use of culture and education. Uh, so OR is, I think, in... Uh, Valoration is uh, rapidly increasing, motivated by many fa actors that are more open to open, uh, like Wikimedians that are doing wor influential work into universities, like uh, actors, the, like librarians that are more devoted to create and work in hard contexts like Mexican. And I think one, one thing that I want to mention finally is that in Mexico we have like a particular challenge because like in Italy, we have not only the copyright law, but we have also a heritage law that is aiming to protect the theft of pieces, archaeological pieces, but that law have some specific clauses around the diffusion and around the publishing of the images or videos or sounds of the, the heritage. So uh, I think that law was created in the 70s, which was uh, created in a context of a robbery of many pieces like in Italy, like in many parts of the world. And uh, so the, cre the creators, the educators, the teachers, uh, faces that they treat not only by copyright, but also for the the organism which have uh, the protection of the heritage, which is which which have uh, uh, income uh, by the paid or, or or painting photos. If you want to use a video photo of the Aztec calendar or a picture of of Chichen Itza pyramid, you need to pay to the government. And we don't have like a exclusion or we don't have a limitation of that law that can protect the use of rational uses or um, or yeah uses like cultural educators you are in the same suspicious if you use without authorization. So actually, I have uh, the evidences and research on some cases, like uh, one project which is very close to me is called Libreta Negra, like book, uh, Black Book. They create in TikTok and YouTube videos that shows the cultural heritage in Mexico, explaining what the meaning of the pyramids, and they are constantly sued by the lawyers of the of the, of the the ministerium that have the, the history and the heritage and protection. It's called in Spanish INA. Because the argument of INA is that you are uh, facing, or you are threatening the patrimony, you are threatening the heritage if you are publishing without permission. But uh, I think we supported them giving arguments to the authority that the documentation or the publishing or the register or the voluntary registration of materials of heritage is a way of protect it. Uh, for an example, we have an uh, uh, in Wikimedia, we, we have an initiative which is called Wikilove's Monuments. Uh, many of you participated or organized Wikilove's Monuments. And for example, in Mexico, uh, two churches uh, exist only in a, in a photo that was registered in Wikilove's Monuments because uh, we lost them, both churches, in one in an earthquake and another one in a demolition, a illegal demolition. So that's a way to protect their heritage. Um, so we are working closely now with the new government. We are very we have hope that they can understand the value of the limitations uh, that we need in, in the law for uh, have more resources, open educational resources. And I think uh, 
we can want to share and we are so happy to share with other strategical uh, sectors like LAMS in Mexico, uh, they, the idea that they are part of ensuring rights. They, they are part of the longest chain to protect the, the rights like education and culture in contexts like Mexico that it's so urgent and so necessary and it's so hard to work these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Okay, I don't have a follow-up question yet, but don't worry, I do. Um, <laughs> next, uh, Joanna is joining us here from uh, the University of Krakow, um, where she studies heritage and, yeah, chair, she's the UNESCO Chair of Heritage and Urban Studies at, the, at Krakow University of Economics, the Europa Nostra Heritage Hub in Krakow. Yes. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, my question for you is, what is the potential impact of open heritage for the development of cities? And additionally, how can openness support growth of the creative sectors? Uh, thank you very much for, for the questions and for, uh, for the invitation here. It's a pleasure to be here and to share a different perspective since I'm not a lawyer and I don't know much about copyright. Uh, but I hope I know something that I can offer you uh, as an example of how heritage can impact development of uh, cities. And uh, first of all, I would like to mention something, some pro a project that was done a couple of years ago uh, that I think it's quite relevant here now, which was called Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe, which was one of the first projects that gather evidence that heritage as such has great impact both on economy, society and culture. And it was one of our first European projects, uh, pan-European project. And uh, I think its uh, findings are still quite quite le relevant, I'm sorry. And they are relevant also to your question because uh, that impact is also uh, meant for the cities. And uh, when you think about the cities, I th there are many ways to describe the development, right? But uh, I, since I'm an economist, uh, I, uh, I am a cultural economist, so I... Uh, do some work concerning soci sociology or society impacts as well as uh, economic impacts. And, and I was thinking that I should uh, tell you that uh, some of those, those things might be quite obvious because uh, how heritage can um, affect uh, economy, economic development of the cities. Well, obviously, it gives jobs. Obviously, it, it, it creates a national product. Obviously, it creates services and... Uh, um, uh, goods to sell, right, and for us to buy. Uh, not only uh, something that is connected with tourism, which is one of the most obvious, the most uh, common association when we think about heritage and its imp uh, economic impact, but also many, many other things. And that's, that's quite connected with the second question you had about the creative sectors, because when I was looking at those pretty... Uh, Design that we that the that is made for uh, for the Wikipedia conference today uh, by some I suppose Polish designer. Uh, it's based uh, quite a lot on uh, Polish traditional embroidery, and also uh, as if you noticed maybe not here but uh, on some other slides or maybe in some other places there is a little dragon and a little funny uh, horseman. Uh, those are two. Uh, Persona, uh, characters from uh, Polish legends, from le legends from Krakow, and I'm sure there are many more um, associations with intangible heritage uh, in that as well. So you can see that uh, heritage, uh, tangible and intangible, digital, um, I mean digital born or digitized, can be a source of for creativity and innovation, which is the basis for the creative sectors, obviously. Uh, because when you think about creative sectors or, or the cultural sector as such, you have, uh, it's quite useful to use this um, concentric, uh, concentric circles model, when in the core you have this traditional culture like theatre and uh, painting and literature and heritage. And this is, this is done mostly by public institutions, non-commercial institutions at least. Uh, and then uh, when you have the creative sectors and the cultural sectors, they are basing their work on that core, on the non-commercial uh, activities. And they are taking out, to some extent, to simplify the picture, uh, the um, uh, pieces uh, of that uh, uh, core, and they are translating that into economic uh, benefits because uh, cultural uh, cre and creative sectors are mostly commercial uh, and they work, uh, work for profit. And that's how it could translate for the devel development of the cities because... Uh, they give jobs, uh, they give products, and uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of that, uh, but uh, mo mo maybe you are, but um, cultural, cultural sector as such, not only uh, heritage, accounts for 
two and a half, three percent of GDP of most of the countries. Uh, it's not calculated in every country, so it's uh, not uh, easy to say what is it for your country. But anyhow, when you look at those countries that did calculate it, it's about two and a half, three percent, and it uh, might seem not so much. But uh, when you um, compare it, well. Here we are in a mining region. Silesia is traditionally a coal mining region of, of Poland and coal miners were always a very important part of a Polish industry and Polish, uh, Polish workforce. Uh, but when you look at the, how the GDP is uh, divided, it turns out that cultural, her, uh, cal uh, cultural sector brings more to the GDP of Poland than the mining uh, of coal and other um, minerals. So that's uh, that's an interesting uh, also um, argument I think for the for the advocacy work because it's uh, in uh, at least in in, in some countries uh, where the service sector is more developed. Uh, this pa this part of the economy is more m m quite important for the. Uh, for the development. And the other part of the development, uh, it's well-being, because I'm thinking that, well, uh, how when cities develop, they develop where their residents, the inhabitants, have their well-being increased, right? And uh, well-being depends on many, many things, obviously. It depends on whether you have a job, on whether you are healthy, on whether you are uh, satisfied with your personal life. Uh, and in some of those cases, culture and cultural heritage can play a vital part. And there, are, there is a number of evidence that even uh, health, or uh, the way we perceive our own health, could be related uh, to our participation in culture and cultural heritage. And there were studies done, for example, in hospitals where people were presented with uh, uh, traveling, let's say, traveling exhibitions uh, of uh, artifacts and paintings. Uh, they were taking part in uh, cultural activities, and they reported increased, uh, increasingly. Uh, how shall I put it in English? Sorry, uh, a better um, subjective uh, evaluation of their health. They thought they felt better, even though obviously that we cannot cure. Um, terrible, terrible um, illnesses with culture and cultural heritage, the way we perceive our health and psychological health can be quite much, quite related with the, uh, with the way, we, with the fact whether we participate or not in, uh, in culture. And obviously the active participation when we do something is much more um, effective in that, in that way. And the last, uh, and the last uh, comment I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to um, uh, give you is, uh, uh, Brigitte mentioned the, uh, the, the, um, the development goals, the SDGs, and uh, cultural and cultural heritage, don't, they do not have a separate uh, SDG as of yet. Uh, but when we go through the different SDGs, it seems that there is a place for heritage and for culture to actually uh, be part of the work to be done to achieve those. And especially since your question was about cities, I think that we can uh, talk about SDG number 11, which is sustainable uh, cities and communities. And it's uh, a little bit about the protection of heritage. And uh, well, part, part of that is about protection of heritage. And to relate to what Ivan said is uh, uh, about the picture, the, that just two pictures of uh, that pictures of, uh, of the churches that do not exist anymore. And actually, that's a quite a common thing that... Uh, that could be quite a um, useful thing to document. Uh, sorry, the docu to document the, the heritage in such a way, uh, because uh, when I was preparing for this panel, I was thinking that uh, I don't know if you know that, but in the Second World War, uh, Warsaw uh, Warsaw's old town was totally destroyed. It was uh, totally uh, destroyed. There was nothing there, and you ha they decided to rebuild it, uh, rebuild the historical monuments, and uh, they didn't have. Ma many photographs. They had some, but not that many. And uh, one of the resources for their for the rebuildment were the paintings of Canaletto, um, uh, an Italian painter in the 19th century, 19th, 18th century, sorry, uh, who who created those uh, paintings with very much very many details of how the city looked like. And now we don't have to paint. Now we can have a DG mod, uh, the 3DG models, right? Uh, three-dimensional three uh, models. So uh, I think that uh, that part of uh, mm, usage or yeah of heritage could also be a uh, a useful way to protect uh, protect this uh, this uh, the cities. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was very insightful. I definitely. Uh, was entranced by all these mm. examples. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, next we have Fiona, 
who joins us from the Wikimedia Foundation, where she works on culture and heritage. Um, my question for you is, what is the benefit specifically that you think, or maybe some examples that you think comes from, uh, f fr from cultural heritage for Wikimedia and the Wikimedia movement? Yeah, thank you for those questions. I imagine in this room, everyone is generally bought into the idea of open access and free knowledge. So I think two important questions that might come up are why the focus on cultural heritage for, for you know, ac open access and, and Wikimedia projects? And then how would this UNESCO instrument really help us do what we're trying to do? Um, so I think the first thought for me is that we kind of want a global instrument for a global movement. So uh, sometimes Wikimedians organised by country, but our platforms are actually primarily organised by language, which cuts across those national uh, boundaries. And we also gather around thematics and regions. And so something like like a global instrument would reduce complexity for contributors and organizers who want to work at these levels of collaboration. I was in a session this week which was touching on freedom of panorama as an issue and I saw people opening up that kind of table on, on our projects where you sort of see every country and the different status of different materials and that's a lot of complexity for people to overcome. In terms of why cultural heritage, I mean obviously we've heard a lot about the general benefits for well-being, the importance of access to a cultural life, the importance of being able to share your cultural heritage. Um, but something that I often talk about uh, when thinking about cultural heritage in the context of Wikimedia projects is that it is really essential source material that we need to close the knowledge gaps on our projects. So we know that uh, libraries and other cultural institutions have contributed millions of images that are used to illustrate our projects and provide this other kind of knowledge that maybe helps establish a more emotional connection to information as well. Um, there's also an example of a project uh, the Wikimedia Foundation has been supporting our communities to pursue, which is Wikisource Loves Manuscripts. And with this project, we're using archival material that is digitised and then tra transcribed to actually bring underrepresented languages to the internet through Wikimedia projects. So when we think about types of knowledge and languages that are underrepresented on our projects, actually uh, cultural heritage is an incredible store of lots of that sort of information and culture. And so making that more open allows us to bring that into our projects and close some of those information gaps. Uh, we also see that restrictions on open access and also just the complexity of understanding what is and isn't allowed in different contexts is in itself a barrier to knowledge equity. And often it's the case that some of the institutions who don't have the resources to digitise their collections, conserve their collections, uh, sort of work on digital transformation of those organisations are also in contexts where it's really difficult to have clarity or, or kind of permission to work with your collections uh, to make them available for education and other uses. And those institutions often don't have the legal resources or expertise to understand or and document, let alone change the licensing of their collections. And these are often very old policies with lots of inherited assumptions that aren't really fit for purpose. And something that happens then is when um, Wikimedia volunteers and Wikimedia gro groups go to those institutions to encourage them to open up and make their material available, those Wikimedians have to focus on sort of copyright advocacy and advice rather than really jumping in and being able to help with digitization or documentation of collections and then sort of reuse of those collections to make information more available. And something I often hear is since we're primarily a movement of volunteers rather than people who necessarily have strongly relevant institutional affiliations, those individuals, those volunteers, often have a hard time establishing like their right to even have that conversation or what credibility they have in that space. 
And so having an instrument from a global body like UNESCO, having a recommendation or a declaration that says, actually, we agree at this level that it is important to open up cultural heritage in this way is something that brings a little bit more authority, credibility, institutional support to the conversations that these volunteers are trying to have. You know, we see our movement um, responding to crises, trying to document and safeguard cultural heritage in the face of sort of natural disasters and also conflict. And no one in that moment has time to be documenting their collections and unpicking sort of the copyright status. Um, and restrictions and uncertainty around licenses can really get in the way of that sort of time critical support. We also see an increasing interest in collaborations between communities of origin and institutions that hold collections. All of this, you know, really strong desire for collaboration that goes, that sort of transcends national boundaries, that's regional, that's global, that's decolonizing, and just having a bit more sort of clarity and standardization and, and that institutional support could make a real difference and open up more opportunities for people in our movement to do the kind of work that they want to do. Thank you, Fiona. That's a perfect transition for uh, my final question, which is for Maya and for Brigitte. Um, why do we need a dedicated instrument? What is uh, What does this potentially make possible for all of us? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, let me just go back a few steps before okay. I get to the <laughs> answer. I have some, so many things to say about this. Um, I could go all day, but... Um, we did a report on what the benefits of open culture are that came out a few months ago. And that was building on what, uh, I want to say hundreds, not quite a hundred, but uh, a lot of experts from all over the world who shared how they thought open access to cultural heritage made a difference. And we kind of synthesize and organize all of these into four main categories. It really helps cultural heritage institutions themselves in being more relevant and more resilient in an age of digitization and all sorts of new technologies. So it's really helping the institutions connect with their audiences in so many new ways. And I think I'm speaking uh, to a converted audience right now, so I won't um, um, I, I won't dwell on this for too long. But the other key benefit that we saw, which was cr cutting across education and research and scholarship, is that it allows much more collaboration and participation and a much more vibrant community where people actually have access and can exchange uh, cultural heritage images or all other types of media across borders. Um, someone was telling me just a few minutes ago that they were doing research and didn't have access to pictures because the professor wouldn't give access to the data without the, the student buying the publication, which I thought was completely absurd. And this was not in the context of cultural heritage, but we come across these stories all the time of PhD researchers not able to publish images of the works of art that they are working on in their PhD thesis for copyright issues or just because the institution doesn't want to give access or doesn't allow the student to publish it without paying a fee. These are absurd situations that we really need um, to address. Another area where open access is really critical is to stimulate contemporary creativity. A lot of artists, and you pointed out to these beautiful designs, build upon existing works, existing cultural heritage. And without free access, we're actually preventing a lot of new creativity to take shape. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people think that there's you know cultural heritage, old stuff, and then new works, contemporary art. These are actually connected through a really strong continuum. And there, there's no separation. Basically, every new art builds on what already exists. And if you cut off access, you're actually depriving contemporary artists of a, of a crucial source of inspiration and materials for them to express their own creativity. And then the fourth category of benefits was about um, society in general. You know, when you have access to cultural heritage, you understand your history better. You understand your past. You can have constructive conversations. Even the institutions themselves can serve as forum for political public debates. There's such a, an important role of having 
institutions enable access and providing space for people to be able to talk about contemporary societal debates. It's really part of our, com our conversations today. So, we talked about benefits, um, but we also did a, a, a report on the barriers. So, Given all those benefits, how come institutions are not embracing openness? It's because there is lots of barriers still. It costs a lot of money to digitize and maintain an online presence. It also is, for some people, a loss of opportunity for income. A lot of institutions will say, well, I want to monetize access, and if I give it all for free, I'm missing out on income. We're working very hard to debunk that, uh, <laughs> that false um, belief. It's actually not really su uh, financially sustainable, and open access opens up a lot more opportunities for financial sustainability. There are also barriers around people. A lot of institutions are kind of um, old-fashioned and conservative, and they are gatekeepers to their own collection. They're like, oh no, we don't want to give it away for free online. Who knows what people might say and how they will interpret it and what kind of uses they're going to put it to. We have authority. We know what our collection is about and we are the only ones who can say anything about it in the public sphere, which is also something that is um, completely counter to how people should engage with cultural heritage, bringing multiple perspectives and allowing conversations to shed many different lights. Um, and then the third category of, um, of barriers that we find was around, was around policy. Uh, I already mentioned how copyright is really misadapted and erects all sorts of barriers for institutions to make their collections available. But there's also no positive framework that says, wow, this is what reality, what's, this is what the world would be if everything was open. There is no such instrument that uh, institutions can look up to and be guided by. Which brings me to the answer to your question, <laughs> is that um, we live in an interconnected world. Uh, you know, there are uh, political barriers, uh, not barriers, uh, boundaries between countries, but the internet knows no barriers, and so we're facing a global problem that requires a global solution. So we need to look at the international level to have a harmonized system that will create rules and standards that um, can, can apply in every country because so much of collaboration today happens to uh, take place across borders. And we don't want to end up with a patchwork of laws like copyright currently has with different terms of protection, different periods of, of, of time that works are um, in protection before going into the public domain with different rules, different exceptions. It's a mess. It's not harmonized. We want to do this differently when it comes to an open access to have some sort of global standard. Um, so one of the things that um, came out of the uh, Lisbon workshop that I'm still you know, writing on because it was so great uh, is that someone raised their hand and said, you know what, having a UNESCO instrument is not going to change anything in my life. I'm still going to have to advocate. I'm like a grassroots person. Having this uh, you know, lofty instrument uh, that only binds member state is not going to make any difference for me. I'm still going to have to argue with, uh, with everyone that I meet personally. And then a UNESCO representative stood up and said, a UNESCO re recommendation would be a game changer. And then my heart leaped because I thought, oh, yes, this is what I want to hear. It re really changed the way that people interact and face, with, uh, face this issue. First, it will build consensus around member states. So it will you know, create shared obligations, shared responsibilities. So all member states need to agree. And so it's going to be a way to bring countries together. And that is really important at a time where so, so many countries are torn by, by conflict. Um, it will erect some common standards, as I said, you know, that are applicable across borders, and it will really foster a sense of unity um, in, in between member states. It's also going to create some kind of supreme law, a supreme overarching framework that cultural heritage institutions will be able to look out to. And if they're lost in what they need to do and they don't know what their mission is anymore, they can always look up to this and say, oh, yes, I need to provide open access to my collection. Thank you for the reminder, UNESCO. And they can also point to this when they're asking for support, government support, or even funding. Because if this is in a law, uh, then the member states will have to fund it. And so it's going to be a really key argument for cultural institutions to get funding to do all the cultural, uh, the open access to their cultural heritage collections that they want to do, but they can't do because they 
they don't really have government support. It's also going to give some kind of common vocabulary uh, and identify common goals and aspirations. Um, in Lisbon, we had a lot of conversations about what does open mean, what does cultural heritage mean. This will kind of um, help give us a common language that we can all understand. Um, I was talking again to someone earlier today who said, oh yeah, our museum is open, uh, entrance is free, anyone can come and visit. And I was like, that's great, but that's not what open means. Right, so there's a, a lot of awareness raising still that needs to be made about what open really means. It doesn't mean that you give free entrance tickets. Then I think it will create a real commitment to put principles into practice because once a recommendation or an instrument is in place, member states have an obligation to report to the UNESCO Secretariat on what they're doing to implement that instrument. So it gives some kind of pressure, it holds them to account. And so there is a mechanism. It's not. It's binding, okay, they, there's no real consequence if they don't do it, but at least on paper and symbolically, it gives some kind of incentive to actually do something on the ground. And speaking of on the ground, it can really lead to real impact that is quantitatively measurable. For example, the UNESCO Open Science uh, recommendation, which was adopted in 2021, really led to some concrete change very positive, and we hope that it can do the same in the field of cultural heritage. In just two years, the number of countries that had open access policies nearly doubled. So this is really a concrete measure, a concrete figure that we can point to to say this is a direct impact of the UNESCO recommendation. Look at how many more open policies there are in the field of science. Hopefully we can achieve this for cultural heritage as well. I'll hand over to Maya, <laughs> who has a, a few more things to say about the topic. Okay, hard act to follow, <laughs> but let me then translate this into a more local uh, perspective, because yes, we need a, uh, a global um, instrument to address gro uh, global challenges, so we need a global solution, but then uh, I want to focus on two things that uh, Brigitte already mentioned, but from a very kind of local national perspective. Um, and they are both about uh, the mindset uh, and the power of UNESCO in Poland. UNESCO means a lot. This is a brand. So having an instrument from a brand like that, uh, that uh, represents for the right reason, the right kind of values, and really resonates, um, has this really all the positive connotations for the policymakers, for the institutions in Poland, there are um, the... 99% uh, publicly funded, this is a strong voice. So this is something uh, for me as an as a, um, advocate for the cause in Poland, this, this will be super useful to be able to enter again into a dialogue with the Ministry of Culture and have the conversation again about them introducing more open policies in their work when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, digital heritage, digitization of heritage and heritage in, in, uh, in general. Uh, this is also for me to have a conversations with them uh, about licenses, open licenses. This is cur uh, currently a struggle. Um, uh, we've been having those conversa uh, conversations for years now and uh, um, I think having an instrument like that from this specific organization from this specific um, entity would be super useful. Then coming back, uh, coming a bit down to the institutional level, um, yeah, Brigitte used the word gatekeepers. This is exactly it. So again, the question of mindset with in many Polish institutions, not all of them, but still the, the trend is there, uh, heritage organizations that um, they are there to protect. And I would like for them to be there to enable. And... Uh, Again, having an, and also protect, uh, <laughs> but uh, having an instrument like that, again, from this entity would allow me to, to have a simply stronger voice in all my conversations with them and, um, and would also require from them, again, as Brigitte mentioned, for all the reasons like there is the impact assessment when recommendation is being introduced on the UNESCO level, um, then uh, Data is being gathered, so there is simply movement. There is there is there are activities, different activities around the topic, and it can only support the case. Um, so a global uh, initiative, a global instrument, can really have super can be super super impactful on a more local level. Yeah. 
Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Brigitte. Thank you, everyone. I have one follow-up question for the panel, um, which I will leave open for someone to answer. Um, but my question is, and this subject has obviously come up a lot this week so far um, and is also very important for Terok, why is it important that we collaborate on this work and what kind of collaboration do you think is needed? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Wikimedians uh, are not frequently familiar with policies, but they have a crucial uh, game-changing task over there because uh, many laws and many realities Oh, well, I, I must say, many realities are determined by laws that are not fair, and that was built by powers, mm -hmm. essentially. So, uh, as, as Brigitte said, um, it's so surprising, maybe, at the, at, the, at the first time, that when you talk with uh, decision makers about the benefits or a more open uh, environment, they say, oh, it's a cool idea. <laughs> Why don't we are doing this? Uh, because we we had like Wikimedians or like activists of 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 the free world, uh, we are frequently clashing with frustration or with the rejection of of changes. No, but I think we are living now like a different situation than other years that can be support the the participation in this kind of materials and. Um, essentially, uh, we have like the big, big, big uh, winning point here that the brand of UNESCO can support and open more doors, because uh, at least in Mexico moves in th that way. That hey, UNESCO is on. Ah, okay, I, I will be on. So, give another dimension of trust, not only of obligation, but for uh, being involved in 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 discussions or in the elaboration of materials that are mandated, but uh, with the participation of UNESCO, which is a very important uh, role player in the in this in these topics. Thank you. Can I add something just really brief? I think we also want um, cultural institutions themselves to be a big part of this conversation and collaboration. And I notice we have some great uh, institutional champions of open in this room already, like Solange from the Paulista Museum, a really strong example in Brazil of really opening up your museum and your collections. And I think we want your voice and the voice of other sort of change makers in cultural institutions themselves in this kind of discussion too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody else want to add something? Otherwise I'll hand to you, Maya, for our... Happy uh, to make the bridge. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> so this is exactly why, uh, building on what Fiona has just said, uh, and uh, kind of what, what we keep um, saying through throughout our interventions is that we need evidence. We need those stories, um, j just to to show uh, the the power of stories is or uh, very specific situations like uh, I am thinking about the. Um, the destruction of uh, of Notre Dame and how it changed the whole European policy when it comes to sudden digitization because suddenly 3D is the most relevant and having scans 3D scans of buildings and landmarks is the thing the the key uh, goal of or, or, or objective of po um, of European uh, policy so a very strong uh, a, um, set of examples, a very strong uh, set of case studies showing the positive impact of openness. And we try to uh, provide you with examples from different disciplines, different domains, how opening uh, up heritage, cultural heritage can impact education, access to knowledge, development of cities, and uh, the, the growth of uh, creative sectors. Uh, so now it is me handling over to you. And uh, we can use, we would like to use the, the space, uh, the 25 minutes, 24 minutes that we have left, uh, to, to really have a conversation with you, to listen to the stories. And of course, then we are eager to, to hear more. And of course, we are eager to, uh, to build on them and really include them in, in our advocacy work. It's super relevant that they are also global, like they can be local stories, but we need them from all, the, all of the continents. 
We are, uh, we, of course, we don't want the European perspective, uh, like my perspe perspective. We want uh, perspective from Mexico, from Brazil, etc., etc. Uh, this is the way, of course, uh, how UNESCO operates, but I think this is the only uh, right forward for us all. That's why we, uh, just also to answer to your question, why we need to do this together, because we need those different stories. Um, so I think this is enough of me, and uh, over to you. So who wanna get, uh, get first, <laughs> or go first? Oh, actually, I think Solange has to be you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share this experience. And um, we, we opened our um, collections in 2017. The museum was closed for a huge renovation and restoration. And at the time, we, are very, we were very concerned about the access to our collection because our museum is a museum of the oldest museum in the state of Sao Paulo, a public one that belongs to the university. So our collections are um, mobilized by research frequently. And at the time, we have only the local um, catalog. So the, um, we have image, digitalized everything, but in the local catalog. And uh, in 2017, uh, the Wiki Movimento Brasil, it's the affiliated group in Brazil, um, looked for us, invited us to take part of a GLAM. And we decided, and um, we used to sell reproductions of our image. So uh, I was director of the museum at that time. And we decided, with a decision of our board, to open this, the, no more profit uh, from the reproduction of images of the collection. And we have now more than 30,000 items in the GLAM. And in, I think it is only good impact for ours because we reopened the museum in 2022 after the renovation. And to be in the GLAM, um, make possible to be in contact with the audience and uh, showing our uh, work with the new exhibitions and um, facilitate the, the, the research because everyone can take the images and, uh, and we promote a lot of events uh, like editatons uh, connected with the, the themes of uh, our exhibitions. So I think that there is only advantage. Of course, these um, collections are in public domain. So in, the, in the Mexico, 100 years, and in Brazil, well, 70 years <laughs> is better. <laughs> but uh, and uh, well, I, I would like to contribute here with uh, a voice that well is good. No, no problem. Have no money anymore from the image because I think in terms of image, public image for uh, the, the institutions is so good to be on Glen and uh, promoting this, this kind of research and access to our collections. That is, yes. thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question. I'm going to get one more mic. Can you explain, or uh, if you remember, why you decided for this shift? Why the board said, oh yes, let's, let's change the approach? Yes, because we were closed since 2013, and with a local catalog. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are a public museum, or belongs to the uh, public university. So we are uh, documenting our collection, our cultural heritage, for research, for people, for open knowledge. So it's a tough decision, but uh, well, uh, how you can give access for this if you, we are closed for exhibitions, we, we are in the renovation, and it was so difficult for the research to go to the museum and, uh, you know, and we have um, our, nowadays we have our uh, online catalog with more than 100 items digitalized is okay, but the impact in week is one, two millions of visualizations. This is perfect, you know? If you really want to put your collection, cultural heritage for researching, 
is the best place. And um, nobody doing nothing wrong with the images, you know? <laughs> nothing. Nothing happens. Only good things happen. People are putting the, the painting in on shirts. And uh, I think like the example that you give here, this is perfect, this kind of appropriation of our cultural heritage. I think that, well, more things, good things happen than no good things. So we decided for this in a very, very special and tough moment of our museum. But I think that in this moment, we have great ideas and we can find good opportunities for change. The, the mindset, as you said, you know, and what's happened. And I thank God that our board agreed and uh, everybody's very happy now <laughs> with this because we have the you well we invite who goes to brazil because our museum had reopened and we knew exhibitions and uh, i think that we have a lot of things in glen and and training people for um, write more articles about the collections i think that now my focus is to bring students and graduate and postgraduate to work in a weak uh, space um, because i think this way we qualify the the, the collections you know, more and more yeah but you have the bas baseline yes right, exactly. the, because the collection is in place thank you very much yes there if you could just briefly introduce yourself, if you're coming from an institution as well. Yeah, yeah. Will be lovely. I'm Heike, I'm working at Wikimedia Deutschland and I'm very happy to support your um, initiative more. And I wanted to bring in an example of a project in Germany which um, is over right now, but that's unfortunate, but it was uh, coding Da Vinci. Uh, so maybe that's a good example of how you get institution in a playful way to open their collections and work with cultural producers or cre creative people from outside the institution and get new reuse of collections. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't gone further to, um, to change policies. Some institutions changed their policies because that would be our purpose or goal. Could you just briefly introduce the project? For yeah, those sorry, because you were all nodding. I thought you know it. Um, <laughs> It was the idea of having uh, hackathons with um, cultural institutions and people from outside institutions who are programmers or designers or whatever. And they were uh, working together for, peer, like for a few weeks. And it would start with an event where the cultural institutions would um, hand out data sets, could be images or audio files or whatever they had digitalized. And, um, and open. And open, yeah. So that was like the education part then to make them realize what it needs to be open. And then they would um, work together with people from like designers and pitch ideas what could be done with their collections and data sets. And so there were really different projects developed from that. For example, they had these images of old costumes, like, uh, I don't know the English word, like this traditional dresses. And then there would be a designer like, uh, um, fashion designer and they would have this idea of um, of doing ki kind of an online shop where you could have this nice doll and so it was a playful thing of working with this uh, traditional images which would otherwise just be displayed or not even displayed but just be in an archive. Um, or they had VR um, designs with images. So they were, they introduced, like the people coming from the outside, the hackers, they would introduce new ideas to the cultural institutions, what could be done with their collections, with their images. And the institution would learn what it means to open their collections. And uh, so that was a really playful, Thing, but it also changed like the mindsets as one of you said it's not about, yeah you said it's not only about protection but it's more about enabling people to do new things with cultural heritage um, yeah so that was a really nice way 
uh, um, to to yeah to o to get institutions to open. And if I might add to that, so what I'm taking from here is that it's also created interest among tech people, right, in in cultural heritage. So seeing uh, um, heritage as a source of inspiration, and not only inspiration, simply data yeah. they can work with, right? Yeah. And uh, now with, with AI, of course, like um, looking at how we see it and how the models are being trained, uh, ethical questions, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we are in a reality, in a situation where this, where this, with, in which this collaboration is, is really also relevant. So yes, thank you for this voice. I think we have more. Hi, I'm um, Tove Örsted from Avant Glam. I'm an, also an archivist. I call myself archivist, activist, anarchist. <laughs> but and um, and I totally support your uh, idea with uh, how to uh, get it around uh, different cultural institutions with uh, like uh, developers and designers. We've done that in Finland almost every year. S last one was the the AI sauna where we got together these kind of people and. Uh, and face these threats that are lying around and talk about them together and kind of, when you know more, you're less afraid. But uh, uh, overall, as an anarchist, <laughs> I use, usually say that it's about the democracy in, the, you know, in its essence, heritage. It's not the museum who's inherited something, it's uh, the heritage of, of all. So especially the public domain should never be locked anywhere. Uh, but on the other hand, as an archivist, I understand them as well. They have in their blood, they have to nurture and care for what they have in their archives. So if they let them fly free, they're going to go and, and, and do strange things and pe people are going to misinterpret what they are, give them wrong kind of meaning. <coughs> so uh, when, you, when we might write this policy <coughs> and, uh, and try to sell them for, uh, for archives, they should you should have this understanding and, uh, and show that you are on their side. For example, that you're not saying that, that the source isn't important. You're saying the source is very important. So even when people use it freely, you really you want the same thing as the archivists want. They, you want to know where is the original source, what's the provenance, these kind of issues. And uh, another issue is, of course, is the pressure from the politician and uh, how the, you know, the governments change, and sometimes the museums just have to make more money, and they have to do these harsh choices. Do I let these people go, or do I take money for my high-res images? Maybe I'll just put small thumbnails openly for all, but you have to pay if you have high-res images, and it's kind of a compromise that you have to live with, and it's not also so black and white, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Milena, I'm from Serbia, and I happen to be uh, two times Wikipedian in residence. So I got involved with a uh, local archive in my town, Pirot, uh, southeast Serbia. Uh, well, it's a small town, and um, archive archivists there are very old-fashioned, like you said. So we already signed a contract with them, we caught them in a trap, so... <laughs> I was there and they were like, uh, you want to digitize? They didn't even digitize a thing there because they only have one flat scanner. They use it only for, for everyday stuff, not for digitizing documents or photographs, nothing on that. So when they realized I want to digitize uh, photographs and upload them to Wikimedia Commons, they were like, uh, oh, wha what are the pictures I going to do there? Uh, will someone make money of them? So they were really scared. And I, I had a battle with them, really, uh, trying to explain to them the, the whole concept of the open heritage. They were okay with uh, me writing articles about um, local people, about monuments and stuff, but photographs were really, really... Yeah, so I managed somehow to get through one archivist. Uh, he gave me a lot of picture of Josip Broz Tito coming to our city. So th that is a very, very um, good collection of photographs. I released them. I released um, 100 photos 
so um, we also tried to uh, make um, uh, collaboration with museum in my local city, but the director said no. We are closed, we don't do that stuff. So yeah, we are very old fashioned in Serbia and uh, I know uh, Gora Gorana, maybe you know her, uh, from Serbia, she uh, organizes glam in, in our country. She has a lot of uh, battles with institutions there, cultural. They don't really know anything about this. And involving UNESCO, I think it will be very beneficial. And uh, it will, yeah, we will do a big thing if, if that happens. No, no, thank yeah, you. Cause, cause, well, you can hold because <laughs> um, I had a follow-up, do, do you have a sense that the, that the institutions where you have been able to do Wikimedia in residence, that those examples are in any way changing the mindset from other institutions in Serbia? Like, have you been able to kind of capture the work well, yeah, that done in a way yeah. that, like... Mm -hmm. yeah. I, d I didn't say that, but uh, they, uh, they really don't have the resources to digitize and to do this kind of stuff. Uh, they don't have uh, people doing that work, so they employed me for three years to digitize. So they really, really said, okay, we need people to do this. And I worked there for three years doing that, not only that. But <laughs> they don't have resources, they don't have money, they don't have scanners. They bought scanner like two years ago that is a little bit better than the flat one. So in my case, they... They got their opinion a little bit better, better for us, better for this uh, idea. Uh, but in smaller cities, I think it's very hard to, to get this kind of collaborations. In Belgrade, in Novi Sad, I think it's way better. But small cities, we are very old fashioned. And uh, unfortunately, cultural workers don't really realize and they don't have the education to really know what, what I this is all about. Hello. I'm actually a note taker, but I'm also really into the topic because I've <laughs> I've also worked in the okay, field as a well. A question: Who's taking the notes now? I, um, <laughs> I I I know what I'm saying, so I could just remember afterwards. It's fine. Um, no, I actually have worked in the field before, and it's still interesting to me, regardless of it was still on my calendar before I found out I was a note taker. Um, but in in terms of what you've done, I've had so much. Who are you? Oh, sorry. Uh, Shahin, he, him. Uh, I work with Western Armenian Wikipedia, which is an endangered UNESCO endangered language. Not the best status to have if you're trying to work on it. Um, but we also and we also don't have a country. So Armenia does Eastern Armenian. We don't have a country. So all the Western Armenian speakers in the world live around the world. Um, so that makes it really hard. But we've been around the world for more than 100 years now. So all our museums and all our newspapers and all our outlets are in different cities across the world. So what we tried to do for the uh, wiki source and commons at the same time was try to get external funding from like non-wiki sources and then help them hire people to digitize their artworks and their like manuscripts, like medieval manuscripts, et cetera, et cetera, but also their newspapers. And mostly it was successful except from this like um, newspaper in Montreal that got the money for the digitizing scanner, digitized their whole 75-year-old archive, and then they were like, you guys know what? We're going to actually monetize this and sell the archive to researchers, even though we did the grant writing and they got this scanner because of us. So basically what we did as like a thing was like, here's a one, like the, the residency program that you had, Here's money for a one year long, like, you know, employment for someone you think deserves it in your community. Here's the machine. And this is the reason why you're doing it, because otherwise nobody gives, sorry, excuse my French. Nobody gives a shit about your artwork, aside from the researchers who need access to the things that you're displaying, but can't make it make, make the trip to come there and live there for a year for the research. So that's the aspect that you have to, you know, approach them with. Thank you. I think there's a comment from Liam. Um, I had a follow-up or a comparison to that comment uh, and also something to add that might be useful to others. Um, I was involved in a grant program, a grant request 
uh, similar to this one from the Montreal example you just gave, for a Bhutanese library um, of ancient Bhutanese texts and a American university wanted to have a good quality scanner that they were going to do the work, they had done all the politics of negotiating the access but didn't have the hardware. Um, and so I was trying to help them get a Wikimedia grant for the hardware and do the scanning and then the wiki source or Wikimedia Commons stuff would come later. And our, our grant committees rejected it because it wasn't a Wikimedia focused activity. Uh, and required, in the process, required uh, a statement from the the object owners that their material was out of out of copyright, which is a sensible question from a Wikimedian, but an extraordinarily offensive question if you are a Buddhist monk being asked to sign an American legal contract to prove that you own what you said you own. Um, you know, promise that you're not lying to me. <laughs> so that didn't go well. Um, so there have been other examples of trying to digitize or that aren't just, uh, that didn't go great. Uh, I wanted to add that might help institutions move towards open access, particularly open access in a direction that is Wikimedia focused or Wikimedia um, aligned. Um, something that John and I have been working on for about a decade um, is an application for Wikipedia uh, for memory of the world status, uh, which is the, the UNESCO uh, heritage status for documents and cultural archive collections. Uh, we've applied twice, two and a half times. Uh, they closed the process the first time halfway through. Uh, we got rejected the last round two years ago on the basis uh, on the basis that Wikipedia is weird and it's the internet and we don't do the internet. Uh, now we're in the process again. The document is in. We're waiting in hopefully September for the next subcommittee review. We got through the subcommittee review process last time, but it got rejected at the political review level. Um, the, most memory of the world applications are about three pages long. Ours is 80 pages long um, with 300 footnotes. Um, is there an executive summary? The executive summary is... <laughs> you need one. <laughs> yeah, this is... We previously nominated the live version of Wikipedia. Uh, which scared them. Uh, this time we've nominated the archive version on the day of Wiki 20. So January 15, 2021, uh, as a representative sample of all language Wikipedias, not all Wikimedia sister projects, um, because they're of all, I'm not, no one is claiming that Wiki species is heritage status. Um, but that this represents a specific and very important representation of a culture, a point in time, a form of knowledge cre creation for a culture, uh, and is representative of that time and place. If that does get accepted as World Heritage Status, we know that the UNESCO German committee is lobbying against it, um, because then they would have to approve Reddit and Twitter um, but if we do get accepted, then that would hopefully become a really big uh, line in the sand of UNESCO says that Wikipedia is heritage worthy uh, and the only live website or born digital document to be accepted in that list, uh, then that would make it easier for education organizations, cultural organizations and anti-disinformation organizations to point to Wikipedia as a as a reference point in justifying working with us. Thank you. I just have one last one. We're going to give you the last yeah. example because yes, you're wearing the shirt. Yes, but we looking at the time. We need to really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm wearing. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing okay. the shirt of the, with the project's name. This is Wiki Loves Living Heritage. Last year, we uh, involved or like invited uh, intangible cultural heritage UNESCO intangible cultural heritage focal points to come together with the local Wikimedia uh, affiliates to uh, come up with pro uh, projects and based on the, the, um, the inventories they have and then uh, create web resources as well as activities around that. And this is only happening this year. This is uh, Wikiloves Living Heritage Ghana, 
but we have also interest uh, for this year in Turkey, Armenia, Australia, etc. We had much more last year. Thank you, Susanna. If Thank I, you to the if, panel. Yeah, if I just may, yeah. uh, half an hour, and we have so many different stories uh, about the transition of a museum, a, a local initiative, something on a global scale, something about tangible, intangible heritage. Uh, and I think this is what we want, and this is what we need. This is, uh, I, I'm, we haven't discussed that, but maybe it would be an idea. I'm sorry, <laughs> just to, uh, just to create a, a, a an option online where people can submit their stories, so that we can build on them. I think this is exactly what we need. So thank you very much for sharing. Final words. Very quickly, thank you so much for being here. It's been really encouraging to see so many uh, heads nodding and uh, like support in your eyes and in your intervention. Uh, please do come to us if you're interested. As I mentioned, we're looking into formalizing ways for people to help contribute. Uh, so uh, just uh, stay tuned and, um, and come to talk to us. Thank you so much. And thank you to the tech team for your support. <laughs>